The first week of the second term of the Murphy administration, what can we expect? And did the governor's inaugural address register with anyone? Hi, everybody. Welcome to Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. We will discuss the Murphy questions in a minute, but let's begin today by exploring the mysteries of redistricting, that decennial tradition that has a significant impact on the state's politics and government and on you. Joining us is a fan of the Constitution and a nerd for things like redistricting, thank goodness. She is the director of the Democracy and Justice Program at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Henel Patel. Hello, Henel, good to see you. Hi, David. It's great being here, especially talking about this important topic. So, see, I, I knew you were a nerd for this stuff. I Absolutely. love it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, before we get to the how, let's talk about the why. Redistricting happens every 10 years because? So yes, redistricting happens every 10 years to account for changes in the population we see after the census. We do redistricting in every single part of our government where you have ward-based or district-based governments. So congressional lines, for example, for the House of Representatives, state legislative maps for our state legislative um, districts, and even in your own cities, if you have ward-based or district-based council seats. It's all about making sure that your vote and my vote are about the same, have about the same amount of power. So that if you live in an area that's now twice the size of my area, you don't, I don't have twice the vote you do. We need districts that are about the same size, one person, one vote. So this is done by whose order? It's in our constitution, the US constitution, the New Jersey constitution, right from the founding of our country to account for the fact that on the basis of our democracy, so that we have districts about the same size, every 10 years after the census, we redraw these lines. So is it all about size specifically? No, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Redistricting is complicated. Here's the main thing to remember though, if you're paying attention to this for the very first time, redistricting is about power, it is about power. And that is why it's always contentious and dramatic and the parties care so much about it, but it should be about power for the people, for us to make sure we have lines that rep best represent our communities. If you just did it by size, for example, as David, as you mentioned, you could just redraw them and say, hey, you know what? They all have the same population. That's good, right? It doesn't account for the fact that that's not exactly how our communities grow. That's not right. exactly how our towns grow. So you want to make sure that when we redraw these lines, they're not cutting up communities in half or packing a bunch of communities together so that nobody has a voice. That happens all the time, um, historically and done purposely, um, where you pack or crack often communities of color, black and other voters of color, so you reduce their ability to have influence in government. Explain what that means, packing and cracking. Yeah, so this gets into a term many of you may have heard of, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is when you manipulate this redrawing process to, to benefit one group at the expense of another. So you often see that with racial gerrymandering or partisan gerrymandering. So racial gerrymandering we see happen all the time historically, wherein you might pack all the Black people in, a, um, in an entire part of a state or area together into one district so that they only have a voice in one district, right? Or they'll crack up where you put them all in multiple districts, but they're so small that they don't have a voice together. You wanna be able to draw these districts so that they have empower the people who live in them. That should be the goal of redistricting. And so how is this process administered? So in New Jersey, and it is different state to state, some states do it, um, just their legislature does it, other states have independent commissions. New Jersey has a bipartisan commission system. It's in our New Jersey constitution. So we had one commission who drew the congressional maps. We have currently a, a commission that does our state legislative map. That one's still working. Um, the commissions are bipartisan, an equal number of de Democrats and Republicans and an independent member who often generally serves as a tiebreaker. So, as you said, it happens on all levels, down to your city council level. In some cases right now, redistricting is, is happening. Maps are being drawn in your town right now um, as we speak. So uh, let's talk about the challenges that the stakeholders face 
you talked a little bit about wanting to bring some um, equity to ethnic groups and racial groups and so on, but this is very much a party function and the party wants to keep their democratic districts democratic and their Republican districts Republican, right? So this is what I mean. Redistricting is about power. It's about power. So the parties obviously have an interest. They want to do what's best for their parties, right? So it's either increasing Democratic or Republican representation. That is always um, one of their goals in how redistricting is done. They might care about a lot of other things, but that becomes a, a really important priority for them. But for the rest of us, it shouldn't be about that. We should be prioritizing things like, hey, do I live in a food desert? Shouldn't I be able to elect someone that, uh, that represents the interests I have here, that we have no grocery stores or that there's no hospital in our area? So your community has those resources you need. So you have a representative that cares about that. And that's not analogous with a party interest. So those things matter and those things are factored in when you're drawing. So depending on where you are, all of the factors that go into redistricting, you're going to prioritize them differently. The parties are going to prioritize the partisan interests. It's up to the rest mm. of us to, by participating, to prioritize things that matter for our neighborhoods. So it's trying to meet all of these needs and assuage all of these concerns that we end up getting some districts that look like the letter Q and others that look like the letter K and stuff like that, right? Yes, so there are some factors in redistricting. When you redraw these maps, they have to be contiguous. That means they have to connect. You can't have a district that's one part here and then a bubble over here, right? You're not no. gonna have a map like, a district like that. You have to have districts that are relatively compact so you don't have something that's like connected only by the New Jersey Turnpike going up and down this, uh, up and down the state. Things like that matter when you draw these districts. But yes, there are always certain concerns that come in. Sometimes they're drawn um, in weird shapes for good reasons, right? They're drawn together to um, incorporate communities that recognize that they're next to each other, that they're that they're part of the same community. And New Jersey, having over 560 municipalities, has some funny looking towns. Just gonna be honest with you. So sometimes that happens naturally. Other times it happens for gerrymandering reasons. So you have to pay really close attention to it when you have funny shaped districts, why it's been done that way. All right, so let's look at, at what the biggest impact was in this latest round. Am I correct that it was in districts three and seven? What happened there? But, but mainly, there were a number of other districts that changed too, and you, everyone should go look up your new district, see if you've changed, because it's yeah. going to matter. We have elections this year. But yes, we saw in the map that was selected, the Congressional Commission that just finished it, its work um, towards the end of December, um, they, uh, the Democratic map was selected by the independent member, Justice Wallace. That map that is selected had some changes in it, um, probably most drastically in um, District 7, 11, the third. Um, in terms of racial equity, the third becomes a little bit more, um, more diverse um, to reflect what it is. Um, the seventh, um, a little, not as much, there's not that much change in that. And in terms of partisan purposes, the third becomes more safer, um, safely D. The seventh becomes a little bit more Republican. Um, so we're going to see how that all shakes out when we, uh, when the election happens this year. All right, certainly something we're going to be hearing about in the weeks and the months to come, and then watching the impact on races around the state, not only on the congressional level, which we're already starting to see, but also in the legislature and in your towns and cities, street by street. Anel Patel, Director of the Democracy and Justice Program at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. I appreciate your energy on this all the time and for keeping us informed on important stuff like this. Always good to see you. Thanks for Great coming on. Great talking to you. I encourage everyone to participate. There are four more hearings, public hearings in the state legislative side. Come participate. NJISJ forward slash um, redistricting NJ. You can find all, the, all sorts of information about how to participate. Thank you. This week marked a new era in Trenton, new leadership in the legislature, and the Democratic governor taking the oath for a second term for the first time since the 1970s. Chris Russell is a veteran Republican strategist, co-founder of Checkmate Strategies, most recently with the Chitterelli for Governor campaign, and Leroy Jones is a founding partner of 1868 Public Affairs, 
and the chairman of the New Jersey State Democratic Committee. Both have been watching the State House closely in this time of both transition and continuity. Chris Russell, Leroy Jones, welcome to you both. Good to see you guys. You too, David. David. How you doing, Chris? Good, Leroy. So I say it's a time of continuity and transition because a lot is changing in the legislature with new leadership while the executive branch is staying the same. Let's start with the governor, but I also want to talk about the legislature too. Chris Russell, let's start with you. Shocker of the week, Republicans gave the governor a thumbs down on his inaugural speech, uh, not to mention the state of the state speech a week ago or so. What should New Jersey expect under Phil Murphy for the next four years? Well, listen, I think the thumbs down in, in large measures because he effectively said he wants to continue the policies of the past four years. And those policies have led to higher property taxes. Ex education is more expensive in the state. We've been locked, uh, you know, we've had a, a state of emergency and executive orders for the better part of two years. Uh, the legislature, I think, both Republicans and Democrats, want more of a, a say for the legislature and want to, more input on how the state's being governed. I think right now, Governor Murphy's refusal to give that up is a problem that I think uh, both sides have. Leroy Jones, you're not going to get another Democrat elected governor after four more years like that. What's what's <laughs> wrong with the picture that, that uh, Chris is painting, Chairman? Well, Chris painted the picture that uh, he should paint for his party. I mean, let's, you know, let's be for real. Uh, you know, I didn't expect, uh, you know, the uh, the opposition party to to thumbs up, uh, you know, the governor's speech. Uh, you know, there, there have to be, uh, you know, some mechanism for relevance going forward. Uh, you know, the governor talked about, uh, you know, uh, you know, 10 point policy plan managing the pandemic, which is, you know, certainly still before us, increasing school funding, uh, you know, making, uh, you know, a full pension payment new gun safety packages, uh, universal pre-K, vaccine and booster drives, same day voter registration. I mean, we could go, go on and on. But, uh, you know, that's the message that, uh, you know, we, we're starting off the year with. That's uh, the, the agenda that we're gonna move forward, uh, you know, in the coming months. Chris, all good things there from Leroy Jones. Uh, what say you to that? Is, did, did, he, did the governor lose all that good momentum by messing up the reaction and the response to the pandemic? Well, listen, I think the biggest thing about the pandemic right now is, listen, this uh, Declan O'Scanlon, Senator O'Scanlon said it best. If, if something is an emergency all the time, it's really not an emergency anymore. It's the status quo. And I think we need to start dealing with this differently, right? I mean, look at what the impact of COVID and the school shutdowns have been on education. The, the first statewide scores from the, the tests that have done since uh, the pandemic show massive struggling by our, our children in schools on math and on uh, literacy, uh, even worse among Black and Hispanic students. I mean, these are things that have real impact. And, and that's why these policies are affecting real people. And this is not just a Republican Democrat issue. But if we're talking about our schools and the impact in education, and we have a governor who is insistent, insistent on a, an executive order kind of government by fiat plan, uh, that is not the way to improve these things. It's also not helped property taxes. And like I said, it hasn't helped things like the cost of education. Let's focus on getting the legislature involved. I think Republicans winning so many seats last year at the legislative level and down on the local level is a message that people in New Jersey want to see some change. Chairman, uh, the pandemic has really destroyed uh, the, let's just say the ebb and flow of, of our educational system over the last two years or so. Isn't Chris right that we're, we're losing, you know, class after class to this pandemic? I mean, Chris, you know, Chris is right. There, there has been a struggle, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, no state, no community, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, been immune to. Uh, you know, we are, you know, still struggling with, uh, you know, the pandemic. The fight goes on. Uh, you know, we're erring on the side of science. We're trying to protect, uh, you know, families and children along the way. Uh, you know, that's why, you know, there, you know, you, you're going to see, uh, you know, an increase in school funding to try to help, you know, close those gaps. Uh, you know, there's also, uh, you know, going to be, uh, you know, a strong effort made to continue, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, affordable health care, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, higher education, uh, you know, making that more affordable, uh, you know, but also what Chris didn't talk about, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, the messaging, uh, you know, on containing property tax that that's a, a foundation of, uh, you know, the governor's remark at his state of the state and his inauguration. The one thing on that, and Jack talked about this in the campaign, you can save lives and livelihoods 
at the same time, you can you can keep the, and protect the public health and also not let our students get swept away by this pandemic, a generation of them, two of them, you know, I have in school now as well, right? Sixth and an eighth grader. I think what we need to see, and, and again, this is why I hope, you know, Chairman Jones would, would agree that put this up for a vote. Declan O'Scanlan has a bill that he's going to introduce talking about letting the legislature have a say on whether these executive orders continue ad infinitum. I, I think it makes sense to put that up for a vote and make the Democrats vote on that, because I'm sure I know there's some Democrats who don't agree with the way this is, with this is happening in the legislature. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think the governor's had had uh, you know received high marks during the uh, you know during its uh, with his handling of the pandemic. I mean that's been clear, uh, you know, and uh, you know we all you know we all know that. I mean the struggle you know continues uh, you know nationwide. Uh, you know New, New Jersey's not immune to that. You know I think we just have to con you know continue um, you know moving forward. You know we have a governor that uh, you know uh, you know is focused on science. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, his handling, uh, you know, in as much as, uh, you know, it, it doesn't always, uh, you know, predict a and play a rosy picture, you know, it has been one that is, uh, you know, just steeped in making sure that, uh, you know, young people are safe and that, you know, and their families are healthy. Chris, the Republicans have installed the leadership team that is on the conservative side, let's say. Are they reflecting a change in the Republican Party? in New Jersey? Uh, listen, I, I don't, listen, Senator Kane obviously left the legislature to run for Congress and, and John Brandvick, Senator now Brandvick, left the assembly to run for the Senate. So there's going to be a change regardless. I, I think Senator Orho and Assemblyman DeMeo uh, have both been strong leaders in the state. I think the state party is energized. I think Republicans are energized about an ability to have a bigger voice in Trenton following the election. Again, adding those seats, really dominating South Jersey in a way that hadn't been seen. And I think Everyone on this Zoom would say they'd be surprised by the, the uh, Senator Sweeney losing and others. I mean, so Republicans have a resurgent voice. And I think you're going to see that voice be amplified, not just by Senator Zoraho and Assemblyman DeMeo, but by Republicans across the state who, who want a, a bigger role in governing and believe the people have, while not electing Jack Chiarelli, certainly have given uh, Governor Murphy a, a, a close call uh, through high and tight, right, if you're looking for a baseball analogy, and said, we want a voice. But is that energy that the party is feeling? Is it coming from the Mike Testas uh, of the party, the, the, the Trump end of the party? I, I think it's, it's coming from all ends of the party. So look at you know, Vince Palestina and Gene Stanfield, two senators from South Jersey. I don't think either you'd classify as Trump Republicans necessarily. Uh, they, they represent Durr. moderate districts. And I think you, so the Republican Party has got a big tent and a lot of ideas. I think they're uh, that's what we and I believe that the party has to continue to grow. We win elections by addition, not subtraction. So, uh, you know, I think the Republican voice from all corners should be amplified. But even so, and not to beat a dead horse on this issue, but uh, in, in the assembly, um, Assemblywoman Munoz got passed over because the general consensus was that she wasn't conservative enough. Well, I mean, listen, I, 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 what happens behind the, uh, the, the, in the caucus room and how they elect their leaders is up to them. Ultimately, that's how it came out for us. But my point is the party for New Jersey, and I think Jack proved this, we have to be a party that broadens our, our reach and broadens our perspective and is a bigger tent. We're not going to win by playing hard to the right. We're not going to run. We're not going to win by trying to be too squishy in the middle either. We have to be a party that stands for something and expands its reach. Chairman, you would probably agree that the uh, GOP needs to have a bigger tent. Any indications that uh, they're they're building an extension to their Republican tent in 2022? Well, unfortunately, I don't see that. Um, you know, I you know I'm sitting here marveling. Uh, you know, as Chris waxes on, you know, just trying to uh, you know to blend the uh, the conservative ends of, of his party against the moderate ends of the party. I mean, it's been a struggle. Uh, you know, folks. You know, good good Republicans, and I do, you know, I do know that there are good Republicans out there like John Bramnick, you know, like Nancy Munoz, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, have been, uh, you know, particularly Nancy Munoz, who have been shut down, uh, you know, by the conservative side of the party. That's going to be a struggle from within that little tent. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, continue to watch that play out. Uh, you know, as, uh, you know, we continue these dialogues going forward, I think, I think Chris is going to probably have to tweak his playbook a little bit, uh, you know, to, uh, to conquer, you know, those issues that exist there. Listen, I, I think, I, all, with the, all due respect, of course, I, if you look at your party, there are certain members of the legislature. I knew you were going to say that. The <laughs> They're not in the legislature anymore because the party, the Democratic Party, has gone too far left. It's gotten too extreme. 
And, and that, that was a, it wiped people out. And I think it will wipe more out if that continues. So if you want to go down that path, sir, keep on heading down that path. We'd love it. Well, keep, keep coming. Cause uh, you know, I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to walk with you on this one. Uh, you know, that, you know, that was a once in a you know, once in a lifetime, uh, you know, phenomenon that occurred during this past election. Uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, a lot of the dysfunction that, uh, you know, came out of, of Washington and, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, that, uh, though, you know, that era, that, that area of the, you know, the state, you know, is a, uh, you know, is a Trump, you know, worshiping area of the state. And, uh, you know, and all that, uh, you know, kind of uh, culminated into, you know, those wins that, uh, you know, that, that the Republican Party uh, enjoyed uh, for that brief moment in time. Well, there the will reality be another is, time. Uh, 2023 is coming, Chris. And, uh, you know, we will, we, you know, we will be writing a new story on this, uh, you know, on this ongoing saga. The second legislative district and the eighth legislative district did not were not Trump districts. They were districts Joe Biden won and Democrats were rejected. So I think that's something, you know, Senator Goldpound and others are watching this interview, I'm sure, with bated breath, because if you continue on that path, they might not have a seat in two years. I doubt that very much, but, uh, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, go back and, uh, you know, and remind you that uh, dysfunctionalism in Washington, you know, which occurs, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, and I have to admit, uh, you know, in, on both sides of the aisle, you know, have, uh, you know, caused frustration up and down this state. And, uh, you know, that was a byproduct of that, uh, that frustration. On that, we can agree. <laughs> so, Chairman, we talk about affordability and, and kitchen table issues. We're hearing about that um, and how that's the message from voters. But is that just code language for no. more issues close to white suburbanites and fewer issues closer to black and brown people in the cities? No, 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 no. I mean, those are, you know, those are very real conversations that, uh, you know, have to occur, David. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, I mean, the, some of the messaging, and, and you can see that through the polling, you know, that, uh, you know, was a little bit, uh, you know, off on our side. And I mean, nobody's going to run away from that. That's real. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, we do have to get back to, uh, you know, just grassroots, uh, you know, conversations, uh, you know, up and down the stage, regardless of, uh, you know, what your ethnicity is, uh, you know, or uh, what your socio income status is, you know, it is, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a real uh, concern to, uh, to have those conversations, and, uh, you know, to move forward with, you know, uh, you know, plausible and meaningful input from, you know, voters that, uh, you know, we all want to make sure are represented properly. Chris, we just had a discussion about redistricting with uh, Henel Patel. Uh, Republicans objected to the new congressional map. What's wrong with them? Well, listen, the, maps, the new congressional- The maps, I mean. Yeah, listen, the new congressional map it was an attempt to make these races non-competitive. Uh, you know, Judge Wallace's reasoning was, was insulting, frankly, and I know he's now tried to walk it back, but the reality is you took very competitive districts from the last map that where the map was frankly responsive to the political environment. When, when Republicans struggled nationally in 2018, the map here rewarded Democrats. That same map in 2022 would have rewarded Republicans, given the very dysfunction that, that Leroy's talking about on, on his party's side now. Instead, what, they, what the map, new map does is make those districts like three, five, and 11 much more Democratic. They're still winnable for Republicans. Jack Chiarelli was very competitive in all three of them but they're more challenging. And I think, you know, personally, this is not a Republican Democrat thing. I think we'd be much better off having more competitive races, more competitive fights. That leads to better candidates and leads to probably better government at the end of the day too. So I, I, this maps a disservice. It tries to lock in a, a 9-3 majority, uh, maybe 10-2 right. uh, for Democrats. And that's not what this state is right now. It's not a 9-3 or 10-2 state. Chairman, you like this map. Yep, I like the map. <laughs> All right, let me leave it right there. Republican strategist. I like Chris the map. Russell, <laughs> and New Jersey State Democratic Committee Chair, Leroy Jones. Good to see you guys. Thanks Thank for coming on with us. Good to see you guys too. Take care, Chris. Good to see you, man. You too, Leroy. All right, that's chat box for this week. Thanks also to Henel Patel. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more chat box and other interesting stuff like NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler and NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. I'm David Cruz. For the entire crew over here, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ, the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. 
NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.